Okay, today we are picking up with chapter 14, looking at the Great Depression and how it begins. So, our economy at this time was in some trouble. It was basically a sick economy. Um, we had some economic troubles, especially in our industri industrial areas like textiles, which is like clothing, cloth production. Um, steel was having some problems. The railroad industry was having problems. They were all barely making a profit. Um, the railroad had been losing business to trucks and buses and cars, just the fact that technology was, was improving and there's other methods of transportation other than the railroad for people to look at. Uh, the textile industry was, was suffering because of competition from foreign countries that they, they could undercut the price. Um, mining and lumbering industries are also going to have diminished demands um, after the war after World War One, and so um, there's other power sources as well like hydroelectric power, natural gas, oil, all kinds of stuff out there that is going to make it more difficult for the coal industry and for lumber industry and all kinds of stuff. Now there were some boom industries, things that were kind of taking off during this time period right after World War One. Um, the automobile um, industry had been doing good during the 1920s, the construction industries were doing good, but then about the end of the 1920s, 1928, 29, that's when it starts to slough off again because people just aren't needing as much. Farmers are also struggling as well. Um, the demand for wheat and corn, which during the war was very, very high, is going to plummet. Um, the farmers during the war had begin had begun, excuse me, to plant more crops. They took out loans in order to get more land so they could plant more wheat and corn and buy more equipment to harvest it, which was great when demand was high because they could make a profit and they could pay off those loans. However, after the war, demand is going to fall and they aren't selling as much as they thought and now they no longer can make their payments and they have difficulty paying off their loans and when they can't pay they either lost their farms or they defaulted and on their their loans and the banks lost money so there's all kinds of stuff that's happening now the government is taking a look at this they know that these issues are occurring and so they're trying to figure out well what can we do to help one of the things that is going to be proposed through Congress is the McNary Hogan bill and this would create federal price supports for agriculture. Basically, it would keep certain price levels at or above market value, and the government would be doing this in order to help out the agriculture industries, to help out farmers. So how this would work is, first, the government would buy any surplus crops that the farmers had, and they would buy it at prices higher than the market rate. So the farmers are making money. Then they would turn around the second step is to sell it to the world market and they would sell it to Asia and Africa and, and, and Europe, but they would sell it at lower than market value. So the government is taking a loss here. And what they're going to do then, because that creates a loss, the third step is that the government is going to tax domestic food sales. So they would have a, a tax on food and the cost would then go on to the consumer that they would shoulder the burden of helping the farmers out. So, like I said, this was the McNary Hogan bill, so it hadn't gone through Congress yet. Congress was looking at it and proposing it, and Congress is going to pass it twice, but each time Coolidge, President Coolidge, is going to veto it. So, Congress passes it twice, and Coolidge vetoes it both times. Basically, Coolidge said, you know, farmers have never made money, so there's nothing the government should be able to do about it. Nothing the government should do about it. That They should just stay out of it. And so farm prices are going to remain low and the farming industry is going to continue to struggle. But it's not just the farmers that are struggling. Consumers are also struggling during the late 1920s. And so consumers have less money and because they're having less money, they're buying less because of the high prices, because their wages haven't gone up. They had stagnant wages. Um, they begin overbuying on credit. And there is this huge uneven distribution of income that the wealthy had a lot of the money and the poor or the, even the middle class didn't have a whole lot of the money. People tended to be living on credit, which means they were living beyond their means. They're buying things that they cannot physically afford for themselves, but they keep putting out on credit. Um, like I said, that uneven distribution of income is a huge factor. About half of the families in America at the time earned less than $1,500 a year, and that was the that was the minimum, that was the poverty cutoff uh, needed for a decent standard of living, $1,500, and 
Half of the families in America earn less than that. The average man or woman would buy maybe one new outfit every year, and I'm sure that's just atrocious to some of us who are closet hogs and, and have a closet full of clothes kind of thing. Um, but for the rich, life's pretty good because their incomes are going to rise by 75%, so they're, they're actually making a, a lot of money. Now, in 1928, we have an, uh, an election, and so there's going to be a new president. Uh, Coolidge had decided not to run, and so there's all kinds of people running for office. And the candidates that are going to come to the forefront for the Democrats and the Republicans, um, the Republicans will be headed up by Herbert Hoover, who was an Iowan. He's a native Iowan. Uh, he was a mining engineer. He had never run for po public office before, but he had worked within the government, working for um, as Secretary of, of Commerce, um, very prosperous years as Secretary of Commerce, became very, very famous for what he was doing. Um, he was very formal, very reserved. He had this poor un upbringing, so he kind of could relate to the poor. Um, but he hated being in the spotlight. It just really wasn't his thing. He, he, he tended to be more of a, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you if I have to kind of guy. Up against him is Democrat Alfred E. Smith. And Alfred Smith was from New York. He's a career politician. He'd been in politics. His family had been in politics for um, a good while. He was very witty, very outgoing, very, he loved to be in, in front of the cameras and in front of reporters and, and getting the attention. Um, but he also came from a poor upbringing, so he, he's very similar to Herbert Hoover in some respects. In personality respects, they're very, very different from each other. Now, unfortunately, Alfred Smith had two things that were against him. Number one, he was Roman Catholic, and there was this huge fear in the United States that a Roman Catholic president would listen to the Pope rather than to the people of the United States. So that was a huge concern. Um, it will come up again when Kennedy is running for president. Um, his second strike against him is that he is opposed to prohibition, and he's running in 1928 when prohibition is still fairly well supported and he he wants to get rid of it so it's kind of a he he was on the side of what the public will eventually be feeling but at the time he wasn't where it wasn't where he needed to be so Hoover is going to get elected because of Smith's two drawbacks the main one being the Roman Catholic part so Hoover gets elected to be president, and he has to deal with this economic situation that is developing in the United States. And one of the major concerns is the stock market. Now, confidence in the nation's economy was pretty high at this point, even though some economists had warned that there were weaknesses within the structure, that there was some problems going on. But many people were investing in the stock market. It seemed to be the thing to do. It was a way to get rich quick kind of thing. Um, we were in a period of a bull market, and that means that um, we have rising stock prices. So you'll oftentimes hear that um, our economy referred to as a bull market, which means prices are rising. If it's a bear market, uh, prices are going down. So in the 1920s, there was a lot of speculation going on. And speculation means that you are buying stocks, hoping that you're going to make a big profit really quickly, even though you might be speculating on something that's very, very risky. So there's a lot of buying and selling going on. The market is high, but it doesn't really reflect the real worth of companies or their products. And um, if even if you didn't have a whole lot of money to invest in the stock market, you still could. Um, a lot of people bought on margin. And buying on margin means that you're going to pay a small percentage of the stock price as a down payment, and then you borrow the rest. And you could borrow up to 75%. So let's say I had $100 that I wanted to or a $100 stock that I wanted to buy. I could borrow up to $75 of it and hope that when it pays out, I can pay that loan back and still make money. And I could just put down $25 of it. And um, it's a minimal risk for me for the most part, especially since stock prices were doing so great. And so this works as long as stock prices go up, but if stock prices drop, so let's say my, my $100 stock all of a sudden drops to 50 bucks, I got to come up with that 75 and I don't have it anymore. It's not non-existent. So it, it does become sort of a problem. Eventually what will happen is we have this event called Black Tuesday that will take place. Now it doesn't just out of the blue happen. There's a whole lot of things that lead up to that. Um, in September of 1929, uh, the stock market 
the stocks are going to peak and then they begin to decline decline and confidence in our stock market is going to diminish a little bit and investors begin to sell off some of their stock as a precaution and it's not like this doesn't happen every day it does it happens all the time by October 24th 1929 however the market is going to plunge and because of that there's going to be a massive unloading of shares and that's what's going to lead us to Black Tuesday which is October 29th and the bottom pretty much falls out of the market things that like that share I wanted to buy for a hundred bucks are now going to be worth zero so companies completely lose their backing and all kinds of stuff there's a frantic selling of stocks basically trying to get like if 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 I was trying to get rid of my hundred dollar stock and try and get any money out of it I'd be selling it for like a dollar just so I could get something out of it and so there's this fra frantic selling of stocks um, people who bought on margin are gonna end up with these huge debts that they cannot repay others had used their life savings and they lose it all there's nothing there to guarantee that your your money's safe um, roughly 16 million shares will be dumped on Black Tuesday that October 29th by November about 30 billion dollars had been lost in the stock market and it just devastates the economy it devastates the American people so the Great Depression is sort of kicked off by this stock market crash however most economists and most historians agree that the stock market crash marks the beginning of the Great Depression, but it doesn't necessarily cause it. It's just brought on more quickly because of the stock market crash. But the Great Depression was probably going to happen anyway. So the most agreed upon factors, there's four of them, of why this Great Depression happens. The first one is that we basically just had old and dying industries. Our equipment was outdated. Um, we were less competitive with the rest of the world. We just hadn't been keeping up. We hadn't been as innovative as we should have been, all kinds of stuff. So that's a big part of it. The second factor is that there was a crisis in the farming industry that was not being addressed. The farming industry was producing more than it sold. It had enormous debt that it had to repay and there was really no help in sight for them. The third is easy credit. That's the third factor, um, that there was enormous personal debt that was being built up because of installment plans or buying on credit, all kinds of stuff. And then four, that unequal distribution of income. There's very little money being given or salaried, paid to the working people. And the working people are your consumers. They need to have money to spend in order to buy food and clothing and that kind of stuff. And that helps kickstart your economy. But when most of your wealth is with the rich who are setting it into a bank or investing it, you're not really buying product with it, that's going to cause a problem. And so these factors are going to lead to less demand for goods. And because nobody's buying goods, these companies can't make money. When they can't make money, they begin to lay off people. So we see high unemployment starting to take place as well. So we have this huge financial collapse that's going to take place. After the crash, people are going to begin to take their money out of banks because if you had some savings, that's what you're going to be able to live on, especially if you lost your job or something like that. But many banks couldn't cover the withdrawals that people were making, people coming in to take their money, because the banks don't just let that money sit there, they use that money. And the banks had invested it and lost money in the stock market too. And so when massive amounts of people are coming to get their savings accounts there's not enough cash in the vault to actually pay them and so a quarter of the nation's banks are going to close and there's no insurance by the federal government saying oh well you will get that money it's it it's your money just because the bank used it there's none of that 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 comes later so that doesn't exist and so people lose their savings on top of it because they invested into a bank the economy plunges as a result. Businesses begin to fire people. Unemployment or pay cuts or reduced hours are very prevalent throughout the United States at this time. So the government's trying to figure out what can we do to make things better. And President Hoover decides, well, we could try a tariff and a tariff is a tax on imports things coming into the United States 
And so it's proposed for the Holly Smoot Tariff Act, and it's, since it's an act, it gets passed by Congress. But unfortunately, this is just going to make things worse because it affects the world. We were not the only people affected by the stock market crash. We're not the only people affected by the Depression. The Depression was worldwide. This was not just an American problem. But what this does, this Holly Smoot Tariff Act, is going to limit imports into the U.S. Of, of other countries bringing things to the United States. And since we limit what other countries can sell to us, they're going to turn around and do the same thing to, to us. Um, we couldn't export our goods very, very frequently because other countries are trying to protect their industries too. And so they're like, well, we don't need American stuff. And they, they basically say, we don't want your stuff. Keep it in your own country. So here's an avenue that we could start making some money getting some demand for goods and we can't do it because we basically have told the world that we don't want your stuff and so they retaliate in a way too and so like I said the stock market crash doesn't cause the Great Depression so much as signals the beginning of it and so in our next video we're gonna look at what the depression was like in the United States